For the last two weeks, we've been focusing on making God-honoring choices to see change in our lives in two particularly difficult areas, choosing to love others, especially when it's not easy, and choosing joy every day. This week, we'll examine choosing peace in the midst of chaos. I think it's safe to say that in this past year, most of us have either witnessed or experienced chaos in new and unexpected ways. The uncertainty of the COVID-19 pandemic continues to create challenges for so many. Likewise, in our first week together, we discussed the racial divide, which has caused anger, division, and fear across our country. All of this to say that chaos is something that touches all of our lives. I believe it's something we will experience in some form or another for the rest of our lives. So it's probably prudent for us to find ways to choose peace when our lives and the world are anything but peaceful. For centuries, people have gone to great lengths to find inner peace. Other religions boast in their ability to connect their followers with the promise of inner peace. Through pilgrimages, rituals, and other means, they search for the peace their souls desire. But it's only to find that it's a temporary fix. They find the peace until the next crisis or stressful event brings disorder back to the forefront of their lives. As Christians, we know that there is only one true peace, and it's available to those who accept Jesus as their Savior. As the author of true peace, he is the only source for peace in our lives, the peace that our souls desire. The world's peace is temporary, but biblical peace is eternal. In the world's economy, peace is found when life is seemingly without any trouble. But how long does that really last? When people align peace with prosperity, it only lasts as long as their financial status stays strong. Likewise, those who experience peace when their relationships are without any issues find that peace is fleeting. Biblical peace is constant, permanent, and found only when we're in relationship with Jesus. Biblical peace doesn't change with circumstances. It is secure in spite of our circumstances. We read in Isaiah 54, 10, For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, But my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. According to Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew word for peace means completeness, soundness, and safety. Biblical peace is more than a fleeting feeling. It is always available. It doesn't happen by chance or by our own power. It is initiated by and sustained by God. Biblical peace overcomes the one thing that holds the world in bondage, sin. Jesus has freed us from sin, and as a result, we can experience his peace. We read in John 16, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Biblical peace is freely available to those who put their trust in Jesus, but we have to choose it. So how do we experience God's peace? In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, we read, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The first choice we must make to experience God's peace is to commit to regularly spending time in prayer, thanking God for his blessings, asking him to help us put off those things that weigh us down so that we can experience his peace. Sometimes it means asking God to quiet our racing hearts or calm our overthinking minds so we can focus on him. When we remove the distractions and focus on God's promises, we find and experience His peace. This often takes great intentionality, especially when we're in the throes of life. 
Even Jesus drew back from busy times to commune with God because he knew that connecting with the Father was the only way to experience peace. We read in Luke 5, 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I'm sure you'll agree that Jesus had much work to do and little time to do it in his earthly ministry, but he still made it a priority to step away from the work, to reconnect and refocus on God the Father in order to fulfill what he had come to do. Consider for a moment what Jesus accomplished in his three years of ministry. He traveled through Jordan, Galilee, Judea, and Samaria to tell people God, about God's love for them. It often changed long-held but very inaccurate beliefs about God and how we should interact with other people. He confronted the religious leaders on the dangerous practices and doctrines that they'd been teaching to the Hebrews, which in many cases represented God and his love for all people. He healed the sick, and he helped people seek redemption from their sinful lives. To say that he was extremely busy would be an incredible understatement. And yet he took time to step away and spend dedicated time with his Father. Isn't that a great example for us in our busy lives? In his book, Sacred Pathways, Gary Thomas addresses the need to take time away from the busyness of life to rest, refresh our souls, and reconnect with God. He likens this need for consistent time with God to tending a garden. Listen to what he has to say in this analogy. If we tend our garden, we'll have plenty of food with which to feed others. If we give our garden just cursory attention, we may have enough to feed just ourselves. If we completely neglect our garden, we're going to be so hungry, we'll become consumer Christians, feeding off of others. When we commit to spending regular time with God, one of the benefits is that we receive his power to bring calmness and peace to our souls, regardless of our earthly circumstances. We read in 2 Peter 1-2, May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According to the Bible, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, is the harmony and calmness of body, mind, and spirit, trusting in the power and grace of God. For me, the area of my life that I most need to experience is peace is my battle with anxiety. Intellectually, I know that I can trust God, but my overactive mind can easily take over and spin me right into a cycle of being very, very anxious, mostly about the safety of my family. It comes and goes, but the worst of it seems to hit me at night. As I've been preparing for this class, I seem to be hit with more and more nighttime anxiety. This, of course, has been a wonderful opportunity for me to walk my talk and practice choosing peace in the midst of this midnight chaos. As you can see, I have a need to have consistent times of prayer and connection with God to draw on his peace. This is not to say that I can just choose peace, roll over, go back to sleep. For me, when those situations occur, I have to draw quickly on the connection that I've already established with God. I pray and focus on Jesus as my rescuer, thanking him for his ever-present protection. When I was in my late teens, I struggled with the most horrifying and graphic nightmares. One of my student ministries leaders suggested that I keep my Bible open on my nightstand to Psalm 91, so that when I would be awakened by the nightmares, I could turn on the light and begin reading it out loud as a promise from God to me and to all of us who put our faith in Jesus. In case you're struggling with fearful and anxious thoughts, I'd like to take a moment now to read Psalm 91 and its promise over all of us. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. 
Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. In the same way that when we choose to love others and choose joy, Choosing peace in the midst of chaos allows us to be an example for others to see. My friend Jill Green had just this very experience when her mother was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, She's given me permission to share her story with you. My mother was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer in the fall of 1997. On the ride to pick her up for her appointment, I had this overwhelming peace settle on my heart. I had a sense it was cancer, even though cancer had never been mentioned. But I just knew that God had me and my mom in his hands. When the doctor confirmed it again, I had a peace wash over me and a calm in my heart. Mom went downhill fast. She went into the hospital four days after her diagnosis and spent 10 days there. She then was moved to the hospice house and would end up staying there for 55 days until her death. During that time, I would sit for hours with her. God's presence seemed to fill the room. Mom didn't know Jesus, but again, I had this unexplainable peace in the journey we were on. There were many times she'd open her eyes and say to me how strong I was. I just smiled and told her it was Jesus in me that she was seeing. When you watch someone you love, who has always been the strong one for you, go through such pain and confusion, it isn't easy. But I knew that God was using this in order for mom to come to know him, and peace kept washing over me. And she did come to know him one week before she died. I watched miracle after miracle as she processed out of this life, forgiving people who wronged her and being forgiven by our beautiful Savior. Jill goes on to say, Peace isn't something you can conjure up. The peace of God surpasses all understanding. It's a gift he gives us in hard times. It has nothing to do with circumstances. It circumvents logic. In the midst of so much pain, loss, and fear, He gave me a safe place to rest my soul. He hid me in the shadow of his wings. God promised me he would never leave me or forsake me. And he was faithful in this very difficult season of my life. What a beautiful account of God's faithfulness to Jill and to her sweet mom. The closer we walk to God, the more of his peace we can experience. In James 4.8, it begins by saying, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. I'm sure you'll agree that stress is the opposite of peace. According to the Mayo Clinic, the rewards for learning to manage stress can include peace of mind, less stress and anxiety, a better quality of life, improvement in conditions such as high blood pressure, better self-control and focus, and better relationships and it might even lead to a longer, healthier life. 
Well, here's another huge benefit. When we practice seeking God in the midst of our stresses and life storms, it strengthens our relationship with him. We begin to develop a habit of turning to him first. This is a habit worth developing, not only to receive his peace, but to grow in our relationship with him in all the areas of our life. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not easy to love those who are difficult to love, but God honors our commitment to be loving toward them. And I really think it begins to change the way we think and see the hurting people all around us. When life brings the worst and most stressful situations our way, we can still choose joy. And when we do, it helps us remember all of the things God has done and continues to do for us. He will never leave us or forsake us. And when we seek him, we find him. It is there that we can experience peace in the midst of chaos. Thank you for joining me on this three-week journey of making God-honoring choices. I look forward to sharing ideas with you during our discussion time. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline online page on our website and click join discussion. For this Wednesday night's class discussion, we will dig deeper into the truths we've just heard and we'll spend some time in fellowship and in prayer. We'll see you there.